the uh, CME code is 15342. If someone can write that in the chat because I don't have access to it. 15342 and then Eagles is 15343. And uh, we are recording. Thank you, Angus, for that. So this this is a uh, going to be a great one because I I posted this on social media the other day and it got like you know tens and tens of thousands of views and a lot of people back and forth. Um, there were some people from North Carolina who were like, "Yes, we were involved in that study." And uh, so uh, Nick Ashburn is from, as you can see, from Wake Forest. Uh, there in uh, he's a deputy medical director in Randolph County EMS obviously an ED doc, and uh, they, they, they run a great system up there. And uh, we've kind of uh, been following each other and have known each other through through the conferences and through social media. And as soon as I saw this paper, I uh, I emailed Nick and uh, Jason Stapira, and they're like, yes, we'll absolutely come on and talk about this study. So um, Nick, if you want to add anything else that I'm missing your intro, but really uh, can't thank you enough for joining us and take it away. Great, well, thanks Peter for having me. And certainly this has been a, uh, a controversial topic, but one that I think deserves a lot of good discussion and looking forward to hearing uh, everybody's perspectives and, and uh, opinions on this after we uh, get through this. So I will uh, sort of do a brief run through of our of the study we did and of our findings and really looking forward to a, hopefully a robust discussion here at the end. So I'll go ahead and uh, get started, so. So with that in mind, these are basic high-level background information points that really we all know. Cardiac arrest is very common in the United States, and current ACLS guidelines are recommending epinephrine every three to five minutes. But really what we did is we called that recommendation of epinephrine every three to five minutes into question. And you know, there is study after study after study after study after study questioning the utility of epinephrine in pre-hospital cardiac arrest. And we, based off of this, we said, hey, there's real equipoise in the literature on, on the utility of using epinephrine in all of our protocols for cardiac arrest. And so we proposed transitioning to a single dose of epinephrine. So one and done, that's what we called it. And so with this one and done uh, epinephrine protocol, we really wanted to know, do, do outcomes change when we use a single dose epinephrine protocol compared to our traditional multi-dose epinephrine protocol where patients were getting epi every three to five minutes? And with this in mind, we designed and powered a study to look at survival to hospital discharge, ROS rates, and favorable, and we explored favorable neurologic outcomes in these uh, in these patients. So we did a pre-post study over a four-year period where we looked at patients who received care guided by the traditional multi-dose epinephrine protocol and then a, and after implement, implementation of a single-dose one-and-done protocol. We did this in five large North Carolina counties. It's a, it was a mixture of suburban, urban, and rural areas. And we looked at adult patients who had an attempt, who had a resuscitation attempted for non-traumatic out-of-hospital arrest. For outcomes, we relied on the CARES registry, and this is certainly a topic of discussion that we'll come back to in a few minutes. But for CARES, we use this to define rhythm type, survival to discharge, favorable neurologic outcomes, and ROSC. And then for our methods, this is, we, we relied on the intention to, to treat principle for the analysis. And when we were doing out, when we were working with our statistician, we arrived at doing generalized estimating equations where we were able to account for clustering within each of the five EMS agencies. And of course, adjusting for traditional uh, uh, cardiovascular and cardiac resusc resuscitation outcomes that we thought would make a difference, such as age, race, sex, was the rhythm shockable? Did the person receive bystander CPR? What was the EMS response time? Was an AED utilized, et cetera? So with, so with this, this is our flow diagram. We had a total of, of 1,690 patients that were included in the study, 899 in the pre-implementation multi-dose arm, 
and 791 in the post-implementation or single-dose arm. And this is really some of the key results that we had. And I want you to focus on the far right column in the red box. So this is the adjusted analysis. So for survival to hospital discharge, our odds ratio was, was one and our competence interval crossed the, crossed the point of unity. So suggesting that there's probably no difference in the in survival to hospital discharge when transitioning from multi-dose to single dose. Favorable neurologic outcomes among those who survived, similar, no difference. Favorable neurologic outcomes among all patients, no difference. Where we did find a difference was with the uh, was with ROS grades. We found that when using a single dose protocol, we actually had fewer patients get ROS compared to the multi dose protocol. But then going back to the outcome that we really care about, survival to hospital discharge, there was no difference. This is just showing the same findings, showing it graphically because I'm a visually oriented person. And so survival to hospital discharge, no difference, but ROS rates decreased after implementing the single dose protocol. So I wanna talk about a couple of limitations that you know, certainly some of our colleagues have highlighted with the study. And this was a, a letter to the editor that was published in, in a PEC. And there are great points in this that are certainly limitations to our study and, and I think indeed to most of the pre-hospital resuscitation literature. And the big point of it is, is that we rely on CARES. And there are several definitions of and CARES that we all know are controversial. For example, ROSC and CARES is defined as, as a, having at least 20 minutes of, of, a, of cardiac activity without requiring further CPR. That's a controversial definition. And the other issue that we have with our CARES data set is that we were forced to do a intention to treat analysis instead of a per protocol analysis. What I mean by that is that in the multi-dose cohort, there are some patients who likely received one dose of epi or no epi. And then in the single dose co cohort, there's probably a few who may have received multi-dose epinephrine. And we don't have a way of verifying that based off of uh, our CARES data set. So in conclusion, we found that there were similar survival to hospital discharge and favorable neurologic outcome rates, but decreased ROSC rates after we changed our resuscitation protocol from epinephrine every three to five minutes to a single dose of one and done epinephrine. So with that in mind, you know, I, uh, there's a lot here for us to discuss. I really just wanted to put the core content out in front of us so that we could discuss it further. I'd be happy to answer any questions, take feedback, ideas, and uh, looking forward to discussing this with you all. So thanks, Peter. Awesome, Nick. So if, if, if we could start off by just asking a few questions. So how long have you been doing the one and done th thus far? What, what's the timing on that now? Yeah, so we started that. So we started um, that in 2018. So we've been doing that roughly going on four years now. And j just to start with the basic question of when you were trying to get the IRB to approve this, what was that? A, was that difficult? Just out of curiosity, or did you have the precedent of Paramedic Two uh, and the other studies to help you get we, through that? Having the precedent of Paramedic Two was critical for us getting this through with our IRB. Our IRB was great to work with, and of course, people have very raised very reasonable ethical questions with it. Um, but given that we believe there was true equipoise in the literature regarding this, and of course, paramedic two, we were able to get it approved by our um, IRB. And, and of course, each of the counties that participated asked similar questions and had similar concerns. But um, I think eventually, uh, you know, believe there was merit in conducting this trial. And since publishing this, all of the counties have, um, have continued with a single dose, one and done epinephrine protocol. Okay, and just to clarify a couple things. So paramedic two, if I recall, was 4,000 people in each group. Um, the group that got epi had a 24% ROS rate and only an 8% in the no epi group, but the neuron tax revival was the same, like at one point something or 2%, right? What, what was the favorable neuron tax revival in both groups as, on a percentage basis? And was it similar to paramedic two? I, I don't remember seeing that number. 
yeah, let me, I'm going to share my slides again. Peter. Okay. And we have, we have Dr. Beach here today. Thanks, Dr. Beach, for coming in. And we have quite a bit of cardiac arrest experts on this call. So I'm going to be, we're going to be going around the horn here to uh, the Carrie Batistas of the world and, and other people here to, to, to get their opinions. Love it. No, that, that's great. So here are, um, you know, I will so read it out allowed everybody but here are our raw percentages and in numbers in the pre post for each outcome and so for ross rates were 42 and then 32 percent respectively but the but the favorable neurologic outcome was yeah. 11 and 10.8 percent that's right and if if i if i mean I, I have to go back to my notes on paramedic two but um, are those are those CPC one and two? Or are you at, or is that how you you classified favorable yep. neural outcome? That's right. CPC one and two aggregated together. So I'm I'm wondering, the the uh, the paramedic two trial had much smaller percentages, and I'm wondering why. Maybe I'm way off, and someone can correct me here. I'm looking at uh, right now, Peter. Let's see. Okay. All right. So while so, so yeah, go ahead. For Paramedic 2, at 30 days, the epi group had 3.2% survival at 30 days and placebo at 2.4% at 30 days. So right. certainly a, a, a quite the difference, it seems. Right. So the question is why why that difference? Now, you, this is this is all comers, right? These are all rhythms? These are all it's, rhythms. Uh -huh. The okay. only people who were excluded were traumatic arrest and, of course, people who were DNR um, were excluded. So can anyone smarter than me on this call ex help explain that? Just because I want to make sure that we're, I mean, you know, I, I think, I think, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Carrie. Re remember, I think paramedic two, what was the, the time to first drug was 25 minutes or something along the line? From from the 911 call, it was like 16 and a half from the time of arrival on scene. Yes, you're correct. Yeah. Was this, was this sooner? Good question. So I will. Or do you not have that? So hours, so I don't, I don't know time to first drug, but our response interval was right at eight minutes overall in each cohort. So that would suggest certainly probably quicker than the uh, 15 minutes you were just talking about. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the, the downsides I thought of paramedic too, is that it was such a, yeah, they were looking at time, to, they were looking at the drug and the time to first drug was very prolonged. Right. Right. So, but but there is a signal here of the same thing, which is more ROSC, right, in epi group, but no no difference in, in neuron tax survival, which is really the big question here. So, and I um, I want to bring in uh, uh, Jim Roach here. Uh, so, Jim, I'm going to pick on you because I know that uh, you now at BSO for over a year, maybe a year and a half, and I know you have some prelim data have moved to something that I love, which is intra-arrest epi drip. So it's perhaps it's that it's that uh, one milligram is too high of a spike and perhaps it's causing, you're, you're not protecting the brain, the neuroprotective CPR that, that we're now talking about. Um, and Jim, would you mind talking about your algorithm and, 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 and perhaps there is a Goldilocks zone that we still haven't found yet, the sweet spot of either the, the the epi administration, how it's given, and or and the frequency we're talking about now, obviously, but um, let's let's consider the actual dose of epi. So, Jim, you want to comment on that? Sure, Pete. Yeah. Good, good morning, everybody. And um, this is great stuff. When I saw the title of this lecture today, I was like, man, I got to check this out. This is great. Um, so I applaud your work here. Um, as Pete said, we do. For the same reasons, looking at paramedic two and other trials, thinking about epinephrine and neurologically intact survival, you know, my our thoughts was were pretty much like we need epi on as early as possible, but the amount of epinephrine, that's the question. So we started a epi drip, and the epi drip is set so it's very simple, and uh, it's in line with what the firefighters are already doing. Um, on other drips. So they get approximately two milligrams of epinephrine over a 16 minute period. So it's much less than the typical, you know, three, you know, every three minutes, one milligram every three minutes. Um, and we've, we've seen, I don't have that information right in front of me, but I presented that at Eagles. We had a, an improvement in neurologically intact survival and our, and our ROSC rates stay about the same. 
and I think Paul puts it best, you know, just looking at these things, it's it's a bundle of care, not not any one thing. So I don't really know the answer to why that's the case in terms of, uh, you know, our ROS staying roughly the same, um, despite not having the same amount of epinephrine on board, but it is what it is. Um, but I but I also think about this in terms not just you know outcomes but you know for the ease of work. So the epi drip is meant to be you know simple. They come on scene, they hook up the drip, and they it sort of start. It, they don't have to think about it again every three minutes. But you know this is even probably even easier. Just doing one dose of epinephrine and not re repeating the dose is probably even easier than an epi drip. So that's great. And, and so and so Jim, you're you're you have a signal towards. Um, increased uh, neuron tax revival. Scott Youngquist, who we had on the webinar talking about, this is last year now, he in Salt Lake did five milligrams IM epi one, one to 1,000, and he found no difference in survival. But again, the, the problem here as I see it, and I would love to hear some other, other comments here, but the numbers are effectively small. And it's almost like a TXA study, right? With TXA, the, the improvement is about two or 3%. So in order to see a signal, you have to have tens of thousands of patients. And here we're talking in Nick's study of, you know, 900 in one side and 791 in the other. Um, Scott Youngquist uh, probably had small numbers too. And the question is, is how do we answer this question effectively without throwing the baby out with the bathwater? So any anybody else want to throw in a comment here? I'd love to hear from, um, some other people, Dr. Dr. Pepe, go ahead. Um, okay, if you'd like me to speak. They, um, so first of all, the CME code for today is 15342, 15342. So there's a couple things. So I had, thank you very much for that presentation. So a couple questions I had about your study is that, one, did you stratify it by time? Uh, and uh, it sounds like from what I heard you say is that you actually didn't, Look at the time of epinephrine administration. You know, in, especially in non-tiered EMS systems, uh, the delivery of the drugs are usually pretty delayed because of, uh, you know, the delay in getting an intravascular assistance in or whatever it might be. That's one of the reasons why you see the IM working, but there's some other reasons for that as well. And so what happens cardiovascularly, the hemodynamics has changed so much at that point in time. The epi wears, you get a pulse, then it wears right off. Isn't that gives those advantages a little bit to the, the drip system you heard about. But the main thing is the, is, is the time factor. So one of the things that Paul Banerjee did up in with his pediatric study, which was really pretty cool, was went right to the epi and got, got, came down from 17 minutes to, uh, what, seven minutes, and then on, finally on to five minutes by having it all prepared before he got to the scene. And uh, so, so the point is, time is a big issue because, I mean, the paramedic study was a joke in many, for many of us to, you know, to see how that was done. The other question is, did you apply uh, propensity score matching, which is really probably more appropriate for cardiac arrest studies nowadays than the head to head clinical trials because of all the confounding variables? So those are started to throw a lot of stuff at you, but those are just I can go into this much more detail. But there, those are the things that would be bothering me right away about how to interpret the results. And most importantly, did you divide out and stratify by whether it was a ventricular fibrillation or a um, non-shockable presentations? So, sorry, so the two main questions I wanted to get from you is one, did you time stratify? Two, did you apply propensity score matching? And then third, um, you know, did you break it up at least by, at the very least by um, you know, non-shockable versus shockable rhythms? The all three of those are fantastic questions, Dr. Pepe. And so for the first one, did we time stratify? So we do not have data accessible to us on time to first drug to first drug. So that's certainly a limitation. Okay. Um, for the second one on the propensity analysis, we did not do propensity uh, scores for this one. And then for the third one, in our adjusted model, we did adjust for shockable versus non-shockable rhythm. Okay. We've got a future subgroup analysis that we're working on right now that we'll publish shortly, looking at um, shockable versus non-shockable. And the short answer there is same results, decreased ROSC, no, no changes in survival to discharge. Yeah. Oh, and then your thing, there is one other sidebar. Uh, did you guys control for how ventilation was delivered? Actually, physically, how it's delivered and so on, did that get controlled? No, we did not adjust for that. 
All right, got it. All right, thanks. That's okay. Well, we'll leave it at that. Yeah, those are great questions. Really, it thanks. also it it also brings up it also brings up the other question, which is, should Epi even be used in shock algorithms to begin with, right? And um, you know, I, I'm I'm looking at the your numbers here. You had 16% in the pre shockable and then 22% post. So you had a 16 and an 84 and then a 22 and a 77. Um, and, you know, again, I know that there are lots of agencies now who have removed Epi completely from the shockable rhythm uh, protocol and, and are only have it in the non-shockable rhythms. And um, there are agencies now who have extended their Epi doses to five or 10 minutes. Some are using half a milligram instead of a milligram. So what, what, what I feel like it's happening, and if somebody wants to comment on this, but it, it, feel, it feels like there's absolutely no standardization for Epi at this point in time. Nobody has any signal as to what to do. And we're all kind of floating in the ocean, um, you know, waiting for uh, the Coast Guard to come pick us up, uh, like the guy from Alabama. <laughs> you know? But does anyone want to comment? Want to comment on like what is the future here, based on what we're well, what Nick presented today and other studies that are out there? Yeah, Peter, I well, I, 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 Peter. I want to concur with that. I think um, I think your your shockable rhythms is kind of is where I I think separating your epidosing between shockable rhythms and non shockable rhythms is where I think the future is going. Um, I think that uh, your shockable Gary, rhythms. Gary, of all people, I should ask you. Maybe this can be obviated altogether in, in an unnecessary question if you can completely restore normal blood flow. Yeah, well, that's 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 the question. Yeah, if you if you if you got if you can get to normal hemodynamic uh, blood flow or something close to it, then uh, then you really don't need epi. I mean, if you uh, see some of those studies, uh, you can put somebody with you know some of the heads up stuff we we've been doing. You could do uh, CPR on uh, on on some of that for. Half hour, forty five minutes, no epi, okay, no so drugs, Carrie, there's nothing, it, one it, shock. Okay, but is your is your marker for that an end title, uh, an appropriate end title? Obviously, we, we can't. We don't have, we don't have an A line. We're not going to check someone's diastolic blood pressure during. I the think end title is your end title okay. and maybe cerebral uh, uh, oxygenation, oximetry. Yeah. yeah, oximetry. If you can, if you can gather that, uh, if you're if you're slick enough to be getting those two things at so once. What's fascinating is about the latest, study, uh, this has got to go through peer review yet, but the results, we got pretty much the results in on the latest stuff Carrie's doing, for example, with non-shockables, and they're restoring uh, not only, you know, really good blood flow to the brain, but the ROS rates are about the same when you compare it to the controls, which is interesting is that, but then what happens is the neurologically intact outcome, which is what you're really looking for, is dramatically you know, improved, especially if you do it early on, so... But that's just a hint of the future. So we'll leave it at that. So I don't want really to get across from the main thing, but that's part of the issue is uh, is restoring the hemodynamics and getting this stuff on really early on, you know, that kind of thing. And I don't think it's getting done. That's not happening is what I'm getting at. And right. particularly for, for relation cases, you know, which was, uh, I think, Peter, I'm sorry, Paul Banerjee enjoyed such success with the children. Right. And and I'll, I'll throw this in uh, for, for the pediatric side of it, where most of the cases are asystole and it's nearly impossible for people to be able to detect a pulse with their two fingers. Right. And oftentimes you have a kid, let's say, who has PEA and you're just jamming more epi in. Um, and so obviously in, so in Palm Beach County, we had a case recently where we used ultrasound on a kid, a one year old who had cardiac wall motion. We withheld the epinephrine. The kid made a full recovery, right? But then ILCOR comes out on November 3rd. It, it's in circulation, the 2022 updates, where they say we do not recommend uh, ultrasound in EMS because it's too haphazard and not many people know how to do it. And it's it's, it's all variable when, it, when in fact, um, it, it's my guess that in kids, people aren't looking at this sudden bump in end title to say, hey, maybe we should give push presser instead of the 0.01 full cardiac arrest dose of epinephrine. So, um, you know, I just, I just think that there's some clinical nuance here that we, we, we may need to be teaching, right? Uh, such as the, the, the end title, et cetera. Um, 
but I just don't think that it's so binary, Paul, like you always say, things are never binary. It's not just, right. uh, you know, epi or no epi. There's, there's other things that, that there's other quantitative measures that we need to be utilizing, uh, maybe downtime, initial rhythm, end tidal CO2, um, other things um, to help us figure out who gets epi, how much they get, and then we have to figure out what is the dose, what is the frequency, should it be a drip or not a drip, does anyone on the call here feel like we should just be removing it all together? Because I know a lot of people are on that in in that bucket of no. just, just I, removing I think, it I think all together. The future, the future, I think, is algorithmic, and I think the first branch is well, depending, on, of course, on what other adjuncts and other things you're doing. Um, but I think the first branch is shockable or non-shockable. Okay, yeah, I, I agree with that. All right, well, uh, Nick. Uh, we're, we're, we're reaching the bottom of the hour and we always like to give our speakers the last word. So after hearing our conversation, and I know that you have some other analyses coming through, um, what is your recommendation for us, number one, and what do you have in the pipeline, if anything, to help further answer the questions that we have? You know, I think, well, I used to start with Peter. There were a couple of questions in the comments that I wanted to take a second to address. And so one was, I believe par patients were only randomized in paramedic two. Once they reached a point where parenteral meds were needed, does this cohort include patients who achieved ROSC after one to two shocks and did not receive epi? So yes, this this was a um, per, per, per uh, intention to treat analysis. And so all of the patients in each cohort were included pre versus post, whether they got epi or no epi, five doses of FE, et cetera, et cetera. So unfortunately, we don't have the ability to do a, a true per protocol analysis. So they I would see. have been included. And then Larry, you were saying, do you know the average number of dose, epi doses in the pre-implementation group? And similar concern there, we, we do not. We do not have the ability to, uh, to know the number of doses in the pre-implementation group. So certainly a, a major limitation of this, uh, of this trial. Um, so I think going back to your original questions, Peter, is, you know, first of all, thank you all for uh, letting me join you all this morning in the discussion we've had here. And, and I think that, you know, our practice in Randolph County and in this area of North Carolina is certainly reflective of what you all are discussing. You know, it's not binary. Nothing is ever easy. And really, we're, you know, utilizing entitled. Some of our counties are using entitled to dose their epi and when to give repeat doses of epi after 10 minutes of entitled monitoring. Um, we have not done that in Randolph County. We're still on one and done, but certainly our, uh, our, the county that we're in now for Scythe County does one dose of epi up front 10 minutes later based off entitled redose epi based off of that. None of the areas in our, uh, none of the counties in our area are doing an epi drip. I think that's certainly an intriguing idea. I would love to, to learn more about that. And, but, uh, I, uh, I'm waiting on the Coast Guard like you all are, so <laughs> I love that analogy, Peter. Yeah. Nick, um, hey, Nick, I just want to say, please feel free to give me a call anytime to just go over things just sort of generically, if not spe on specific issues. Uh, and I just want to congratulate you and thank you for, like, looking into this and doing it, because it takes – it's a lot of work to do what you just sort of summarized in 10 minutes. It's not underappreciated, but thank you so, so much, you know. Sorry, I got uh, so much back. Everybody's uh, getting me on the news. But anyway, to leave off again for everybody else. But uh, what? Uh, hang on. Oh, yeah. One, no, five, Paul, that, one, one yeah, five, three. Yeah. I'm going to make sure we got this right. One, five, three, four, two. I'm sorry. Uh, did I have it right? Yeah. One, five, three. Yeah. Okay, good. One, one, right, five, three, four, two. One, five, three, four. Okay, we're going to pop over in a minute. But I, I would echo what Paul said, Nick. And, you know, um, I think that. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of people doing a lot of great work and their, their work really um, sometimes goes unnoticed. Yours didn't. And, um, you know, I think webinars like these where you come in and present your work or we could talk to the, the author himself. Um, and obviously, you have a, 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 the other authors behind you. We should thank them as well. Um, but again, thank you so much. This will be recorded. We'll put it on our YouTube channel for others to see. And uh, anyone have any last minute questions or comments for Nick before we... Head over to Dr. Pepe's webinar. That was very good. Awesome. Fantastic. All right. Thank you. I got to tell you, that was great that he did it in 10 minutes, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs>
I think the first time we ended on time. Yes. All right. All right, Nick. Thank you so much. Feel free to stick around if you like. If not, we'll see you on the other side. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you.